kiddos time. We had various time. It was June 2010. Uh, Apple pioneer by the name of Stephen Jobs. You know his name. You know Apple computers and Apple phones. He was clad in his standard uniform of a black turtleneck and jeans. He took to the stage like he had done many times before in a huge auditorium while all of his techies were watching him. And his task that day was to introduce the iPhone 4. Now imagine this for those of us who have iPhones. And that the technology of the iPhone 4 came in 2010. Oh, how quickly things have come. So there he's demonstrating all the little intricacies to the Apple fans and reaching for his own iPhone just when they thought it was over. Job says there's one more thing and the applause began to build and all of the, everybody kept looking and then the, the big screen behind him said one more thing and it was as though it was building to a crescendo. And sure enough, he explained how he had had a similar experience in 2007, the start of the iPhone, and now he wanted to do something similar. In 2007, he had made a phone call on his phone, and it was an amazing experience back then. But now, all these three years later, the image of his iPhone suddenly appears on the screen, and the audience could watch actually what he was doing. And so they watched in real time as he touched a button called FaceTime, and suddenly his own face appears on this giant screen. It almost resembles, if you've ever seen Oz the Great and Terrible, projected above the throne of the Emerald City. It was kind of like that. Only his face in this instance was smiling. Job touches yet another button and sure enough, another man's face pops up, appears, and Job's face comes down to the left side lower small box and the two of them begin talking and thus is born FaceTime. Now, how many of you have used FaceTime? I want to see how many of you, about half of you. Neva and I use FaceTime typically at least weekly, probably with our son in Boston, although at times it could pop up and any of our grandchildren could suddenly appear. You never know. But it really is an amazing kind of experience. The crowd that day was overwhelmed, obviously. But let me take you to another time, a long time ago. Jesus stood on a mountainside and conferenced, if you would, with Moses and Elijah. And that's where we're going to go this morning. They never imagined back then of smartphones or the kinds of things that we talk about today. I've often asked people, have you ever had a fifth? Not a fifth, for those of you who had another life, but a fifth. And that is a funny interior feeling. In other words, have you had a moment... And particularly as it relates to a faith experience, have you had a moment where Christ has been so real to you, it's been an emotional kind of experience? John Wesley had one of those. He called it a moment in time when his heart was strangely warmed. St. Francis, who I'm named after, I don't know if many of you knew that. Some of you have forgotten the fact that I do carry sainthood in my background. For those of you who are really believing that, please know that's not true. St. Francis heard the voice of Christ while he was praying, and then a bolt of lightning literally knocked down Martin Luther. I mention all of those because I think faith ought to have a natural kind of part of you where it captures not only your intellect, your mind, your cognitive abilities, but it captures your heart. It captures your heart, and you are allowed, encouraged, and afforded the right to experience feeling in your faith. You're going to see a picture of uh, all, one of the all, many pictures that were given in terms of, uh, of all the ministries that uh, have been, or all the stories that have been told in New Testament times. There's always been one that in fact has overwhelmed and it's either the Last Supper or this. And so looking through a bunch of pictures this week, I found this one because it appears to be one of the more beautiful of those. If you know much about the, uh, the New Testament, you know that this is one of those passages that is found in all the Gospels. We find it in all the Gospels, and it all follows, all of them follow a what we call a hinge moment. And hinge, a hinge is when a door opens to something new. And what has happened in all the Gospels is that there is an opportunity for Jesus now to predict that he is heading down the corridor of suffering and possible death and resurrection. Now let me just pause to say 
Jesus' self-realization, we don't know how much he realized. We don't know how much the God-man was who he was. Was he more God, more man? He was, a, a, he was a combination of those in a way that we will never understand. I certainly know he was God's son. I certainly think he knew that he was heading towards something very unusual. We only can measure it by the Garden of Gethsemane, where, in fact, he said, Now, Lord, if there would be another way we could do this, I would certainly entertain that thought. So he knew where he was going. He knew what God had called him to do. He was ever faithful to that, but he also lived in human body, and so we always have to make sure we recognize that. Now, why in the world would this passage include a reference to Elijah and Moses and, and not maybe some father Abraham or King David? Well, it's really not difficult to measure because when you choose those two, you're talking about the leader of the law, Moses, and the leader of the prophets, Elijah. So if God is doing a history, let's say this is a history lesson, and the history lesson starts on this side of the, of the stage and it goes to that side. If God's drawing a history lesson with us, we call it the history of revelation. If God's drawing a history of revelation, then there are going to be certain moments when the door flows open a little more. But if we were standing in the middle of that, we would be standing where Jesus would be standing about that time. Behind him would be the law and the prophets, and in front of him would be the passion story that he's getting ready to live out. So he's living into the history of that moment and that incredible opportunity. Now, if I could take an Old Testament passage and lay it on top of this New Testament passage, it would be Exodus 24, and then there's even some parallels over in Exodus 34. But it's, this, it's the Sinai experience. It's the mountain experience where Moses goes up and gets the law. So many of the characteristics that you'll find in that Exodus story, you find in this story. Why would you think that would? Again, the reason is he's looking over his shoulder. He's not some new guy on the block. He, in fact, is fulfillment of the line of the law and the prophets. And so Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of that. So connect those dots and remember the power of the past. Many of you know, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time in my last few years of, of seminary uh, writing a dissertation on the ministry and the preaching style of one Carlisle Marnie. Carlisle Marnie was what, we, what I call in the opening paragraph of my dissertation, one of the most infamous uh, Southern Baptist preachers that ever lived, famous literally and many times for the wrong reasons. That's a whole other story. But Carlisle Marnie almost di <clears throat> died from being a workaholic. He, if you read his story, you find out that as a pastor in Austin and then later uh, in Myers Park in South Carolina, he uh, almost died, took him to the hospital. Uh, six months later, he never went back to the pastorate. And for 10 years, he served in a little place called the Interpreter's House in Lake Junaluska in North Carolina. And if you go there now, I think they, you can find the house, although it's used for something different. They don't use it as the Interpreter's House. But... He literally had the interpreter's house for ministers, leaders of churches to come in and kind of put their lives back together because he had experienced so much of that in his own life and he wanted to offer that to, to other people. And one of the things that he says about, uh, about the past I find interesting, particularly in the light of where we've come with this image that we've talked about. He says, our future is shaped by our past. Memory and hope are inseparably shaped. And related to tomorrow has no meaning except against the backdrop of yesterday so what's he saying he says you can't bless anything until we bless our roots in other words we have to recognize that we have come from a place that God will take and bless there is no place there the, no matter where our past has been God can and will and wants to redeem us from that past to release us into the future. And so wherever it is that you are today, if you're wanting to move forward with God and yet you find yourself not being able to, maybe it's because you've never really been able to say, Lord, help me forgive myself for my past. Help me release myself from my past. Help me do whatever it is that I need to do in order to move forward. So if you got your outline and want to follow along, we're going to talk about the the ingredients for a Christ-like transformation. And there's five of them. The first one is seeking. 
seeking. The Bible says about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James, and uh, John with him and went up into the mountain to pray. And as they were praying, the appearance of his face changed. Remember that Mount Sinai story? Remember where Moses went up there? And his clothes began to be as bright as the flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Do not miss the obvious here. We, we pastors kind of want to skip by the obvious because we, we've read so much that we kind of have been here and know that. But don't miss the obvious here, and that is that it, it all began with prayer, with seeking. You and I, in our journey with Christ, we always start with the seeking part. We always start with us saying, leaning in to God and saying, I in fact need you. Let me ask yourself, how, when and how are the best times that you have for prayer? When? When are the best times? And how do you go about your, your prayer times? And I would simply encourage you, we've got a great time of the year to be reminded of God's impact in our lives as we walk our way to Holy Week. And ask yourself, where do you usually, uh, where do you usually go? What is it you're doing when you find yourself leaning in to the seeking process of God's presence in your life? P.T. Forsyth is a 20th century preacher. You're going to see his picture up here. Uh, he's known for a lot of things, but one of the things is his book, The Soul of Prayer. And in there he says, prayer is for the religious life what original research is for science. Now think of that, I'd never heard of that parallel. Prayer is for the religious life what original research is for, the, uh, is for science. By it we get into direct contact with reality. Now if you've been in school recently, or you can reflect back, uh, as certainly as I can, because I went long enough, and it is that you were introduced to the concept of plagiarism very, very early. Plagiarism says you cannot use other people's research. Now, you can reference it, you can talk about it, but you cannot use it and then claim it as your own. And so for us to think that we can just verbalize prayers, just say words, or to rely on the prayers of those that have gone before us is ludicrous. We have to pray our own prayers. It is our original thoughts that we lean into God's experience and walk through that. So there is a seeking. Secondly, there is a seeing. We mentioned a little bit about this um, last week, but there is a seeing. In verse 32, the Bible says, Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. Now think about the times that we didn't hear something, but maybe we saw it. And I'm going to take you to a time in your life. I want you to go back to a time where you, you, you saw God's power and presence. You saw it. It wasn't simply something you heard. It was something you saw, and it was like a, like a post that you put in the ground and said, Wow, this moment is so real and so vivid that I will never forget this moment. I want you to go back to that moment. And I want you to, to ask yourself, have you, have you had moments in your life since then where you've said, eh, I'm not sure I, I really could trust that moment anymore. And what I would say to you is trust the high moments of your life. Don't forget them. Trust those moments where God has moved you to a place in your, um, your, your encounter, your experience with him that has t told you that this is real. This is real. I, I thought it was interesting when the video, we, we had a, a video which is, to me is a really powerful video. There it had a quote from John Bunyan. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And there there is a, a, an encounter between Pilgrim who says to those who are doubting if, there is ever, if they're ever going to get to the celestial city, the pilgrim says, did we not see it from the top of Mount Clear? There are moments in our lives when we see the power and the presence of God so clearly that we have to remember, I will always, always remember this moment with God and I will not let it escape from me. Ernest Hemingway was an interesting writer of Obviously, if you know much about him, uh, we learn a lot about him because typically we have to read a couple of his books to get through uh, English lit class. But you're going to see on the, on the um, 
the screen a copy of his autobiography, A Movable Feast. It is an interesting book in that it talks about his early years as a writer in Paris. And he says this, he says, if you are lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young man, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you. For Paris, he says, is a movable feast. The beauty of those high moments that you have with God is that they are movable. <laughs> that they, you don't simply leave them, you carry them with you in your journey. And those moments are freeze-framed in your mind in a way that will allow you more light in the future as opposed to more darkness. It's a movable feast. Thirdly, there is ingredients of, tri of Christ-like transformation will always include seeking and seeing and now the feeling part. We mentioned this earlier. Now we're going to lean into that a little bit more. Verse 33, and as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to them, Master, it is it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, obviously, Peter was having what I would call a holy hallucination. You know, he was he was having such a good time here. He says, "Listen, we need to plant we need to plant a flag here, and we need to we need to bring everybody together and enjoy this experience. And and don't worry about going back. We, we want to stay right here. And the fact is, we never can stay where we are." We have to experience it for what it is, remember it for what it is, be overpowered by it, but then move on in our lives. Lewis Cheney has a little book that's uh, it's simple spiritual stuff, and she says in there, God, it, the name of the book is God is No Fool. She says, are you feeling blue? Buy some clothes. Are you feeling lonely? Turn on the radio. Feeling despondent? Read a funny book. Feeling bored? Watch TV. Feeling empty? Eat a Sunday. Feeling worthless? Clean the house. Feeling sad, tell a joke. Ain't this modern age wonderful? You don't got to feel nothing. There's a substitute for everything. I guess there is, isn't there? We, if we're not very careful, we can say, oh, I don't want to feel that way, so I'll do this. And so we find ourselves substituting, uh, kind of dealing with our feelings by, by, by putting other things there. God, have mercy on us. The implication is that we can put some kind of activity in place of an opportunity to experience God. And that's what I would say. Uh, Lent, this 40-day season that we're looking at here, starting Wednesday from Ash Wednesday on in to the Holy Week time. And this, it's a period where our Catholic brothers and sisters oftentimes give up something. And what they're trying to do is to remind themselves, give up something to remind themselves to not just talk about God, but to feel his impact in their life. Now, the whole issue of feeling something is a, a double-edged sword, isn't it? I mean, there's a good part of feeling and there's a bad part of feeling. The bad part is, of course, what we see here, it awakens uh, some kind of mood in us, and let's say, let's stay here and, and build this forever. Have you ever done that with relationships? You have this moment with a person and you want it to last forever, and somehow it doesn't. But the good part is, it opens your life. It, it kind of, you know, why, why, do you, why do you go to movies? I, I, was, I took Neva to, to see this new movie out, The Choice. I mean, guys, it, you know, you just got to, I go to, I take Neva to these chick flicks, and, and people think, she's not in here to do her hair to best, but I, I am very good at this. I take Neva to all the chick flicks, and I, you know how you can tell it's a chick flick? Go in, there are no other men in the room. I mean, there are no other men in the room. I'm there, and so I look at her, and I boast myself and say, me man, take you to woman to, you know, because, because I know Neva wants to feel something, and I do too, and it's not like I don't, but movies kind of stir us. Uh, Neva and I like to go to uh, kind of the movies that, you know, are relationship heavy, they have something to say because we want to feel something. And I think there's something valuable about that. It reminds you that life has this nature of feeling. Fourthly, uh, the ingredients of Christ-like transformation will always include see, seeking, seeing, feeling, and fearing. The Bible says that while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid 
as they entered the cloud. Now notice this, you know, back over to the, if you're an Old Testament person in the Sinai experience, he goes up in the cloud, brings down the Ten Commandments. But there's always something fearful about going into the unknown. But the beauty of God is that while he is kind of unknown to us, he is not unknowable. How is he knowable? He is knowable because he's given himself to us in Christ who we can know. Can he ever fully be known? No, God's God. We're not, and we'll, he'll never fully be known. But can he be known well enough that it will, in fact, strike opportunity into our lives? When's the last time you did something that brought a level of fear, but it turned out to be a very positive thing in your life? Let me give you three examples. This week, uh, Heather and Greg, uh, God willing, uh, if they get to Friday, they're going to have a child. And the child's name is Nora. Boy, I messed that up the first service. But, but they're going to have a child, Nora. And I, I can tell you that as much as Greg is prepared for this, he's going to be scared crazy in there. I mean, I just know I'm, I'm a man. He's a man. And I know about these kind of things. And there's never a point where you're not scared when there's a child involved. I remember the first time I took my first karate lesson. Uh, I had gotten that karate gi, and it was all starched out and stiff. And I was standing there with my white belt, didn't have a clue on how to tie it, so I had, had somebody else tie it for me. And I'm standing there, and I honestly was grateful to God that the legs on those gi pants were so big that, that they could not see my legs shaking because the, I was scared to death. And yet when I look back, the times that I was able to... to, to persevere through that was one of the more powerful times of my life. The other thing I would think about is, and I'll remi- reflect on Neva, I mean, the first time I, you know, I began dating Neva, I, I was very fearful because I just knew that somebody this pretty and this nice could not be this pretty and this nice for a long period of time. I mean, I just got to tell you, I thought, when's the other shoe going to drop? Because, uh, I'm still looking for it to drop. It's, it's been very, very good. The ingredients of a Christ-like transformation will include seeking, seeing, feeling, fearing, and finally listening. Finally listening. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice has spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time for what they had uh, seen. How important is listening to your life? You know, the old adage, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. How important is listening? I would say listening, particularly as it relates to God, is an incredibly important characteristic, particularly as it relates to worshiping God. As I mentioned earlier, we are heading in that, down that road where we get to begin to think about Easter. Now, I know Easter is coming really early this year. It's, uh, I, I just can't believe how early it's going to be, but... It's, we don't even get to April before Easter's here. So, you know, there's this preparation that is beginning now. We call it Lent. And it talks about the 40 days in preparation for the coming of the Christ. And, and, and it, it, it reflects off of the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And so uh, I would encourage you that during this time that you would, in fact, uh, walk through the, the seeking and the seeing and the feeling and the fearing and ultimately the listening part of this process. Let's pray together. Father, it's times like these that we your presence and in the moving of your, um, your journey in our lives, we oftentimes take it for granted. We just take it for granted. We've seen something, we've known something, but now we want to fully engage with the life that you offer us. Lent, 40 days of walking toward you, gives us that opportunity. So be with us now as we share in an, share in an, in an invitation time that allows us to respond specifically to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.